let's look at something very important here in Mark 13. Mark 13 and Matthew 24. And I know when, when I first thought about this, and when I first, you know, let it penetrate into my mind to get some of the thinking of God, rather than the thinking of men about what they think God says. Because some people have said, we published the gospel around the world already. They've already had their witness. But those people are long since gone, and the magazine they claim that did it now has uh, reduced in circulation from eight million to a million and a half. And the world is still going on. But here's what it says right here. Verse 10, Mark 13. It's talking about the end times. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. What do you have in your hands? You have the gospel. The gospel being published in all nations refers to the word of God. Does not refer to someone preaching about the gospel. The gospel will be preached in all the world, Matthew 24 tells us. Okay, now let's go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And let's understand something concerning the Old Testament. We're going to make this just a little bit different today. Okay, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and verse 4. Now, we're going to come back to Hebrews 4 and look at it a little bit later, because we're going to see that one of the major teachings of Jesus Christ did, in fact, have to do with the Sabbath day and with your capacity to work and with your capacity to eat and drink. Okay, verse 2, Hebrews 4. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Who is he talking about? The children of Israel. So they had the gospel preached unto them in the form that God gave that to them. Okay? But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So they had the gospel to pre preach to them as well. What is this telling us? This is telling us that the gospel includes both what is known as the Old Testament and the New Testament, does it not? Yes, indeed. It surely, surely does. Remember several weeks ago we covered the scripture. Let's go there for just a minute just to review because I think a lot of, a lot of times when someone comes along with dynamite and blows up your foundation, which is what has been happening, you need to go back and repeat some things. So let's go back and repeat some of these things. Let's go to Luke 24. And here's why the gospel was also in the Old Testament. That is, we know a covenant is God's arrangement or agreement with you. And in every covenant, there are always the laws of God that go through all the covenants. Okay? Now here, Luke 24 is a very, very important, a very important section in the scriptures. Let's pick it up here in, uh, verse Let's pick it up here in verse 25 of Luke 24. Luke 24 and verse 25. Then he said to them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Does Christ expect us to believe the prophets? Yes, absolutely. Is that part of the gospel? Well, it surely is. It told an awful lot about Jesus Christ, didn't it? And it's telling an awful lot of what's going to happen at the end of the world, isn't it? And is that not part of preaching the gospel to the whole world? Sure it is. He says, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses. So you see, Moses is part of the living word of God. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded 
unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So that was quite a Bible study. How'd you, how would you like to have been at that Bible study? Huh? Where Christ himself was telling you. And as they drew near to the village where they were going, and he made as though he would have gone farther, but they constrained him in saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went uh, in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as they sat to eat with him, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And that's what has to happen with Christ. Your eyes must be opened. That's why Judaism is so dead. As we covered several weeks ago, the fig tree was cursed from the roots up. You have to have your eyes open and only Christ can open them. And they knew him, and then what did he do? He immediately vanished out of their sight. Now, if you are born again, that's what you should be able to do. So there are some people who say they're born again, and they make fun of those of the old what was the old test, the hat pin test? Stick yourself and see if you believe. The better one is just walk through the wall. That'll be far more convincing. And then they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? So they arose and they went back to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven together, and they said, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And they told him what things were done, verse 35, in the way, and how he was known to them in his uh, breaking of bread. And as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be to you. Now this is part of the glory that the disciples, especially John, wrote about, where it says, And we beheld his glory as the only begotten Son of God. Now they saw him transfigured on the mountain. They saw him in his uh, glorified form at that point. And now here they see him raised from the dead. But they were terrified and supposed that they had seen a spirit. So he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Now, we need to understand that also, too, today in our day. Now, they had to live through the time to see Christ killed and then resurrected from the dead. Now, today, people come along and try and put fear in your hearts and fear in your minds and try and manipulate things to their to their own use. Now, as Carl and I were talking yesterday, we talk quite quite often, but he said, and so I wrote it down. It's one thing to be moved by God to do his will. Isn't that something? That is true. And that's what God wants. God wants someone to love. God wants someone because he's capable of loving the whole world perfectly, correct? Yes. God wants someone who will have a relationship with him, with his spirit, to love him. So it's one thing to be moved by God to do his will. And that's why there are a lot of independent Sabbath keepers out there. They are being moved to do the will of God. And how many people are out there doing that? And God is going to bring them. God is going to call them. Then he says, it's one thing to be moved by God to do his will. It is another thing to presume that you can force God to be moved to do your will. Now that's really quite a profound thing. It's one thing to be moved to do the will of God. It's quite another thing for you to presume that you can move God or force God to do your will. Now, this is why this is so important here when we come to Luke 24 about understanding the word of God. So he showed them his hands and his feet, verse 39, 
And when he thus spoke, he showed them his, uh, yes, he showed them uh, his hands and feet, verse 40. And while they yet believed not for joy, he said to them, do you have any meat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of the honeycomb. He took it and did eat before them. And he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's how you understand the Bible. By Christ sending his spirit to be with you to open your mind. Can God do that anywhere, anytime, with anyone? Yes, he can. And I think God is going to demonstrate it. I think God is going to purposefully do that so that if any minister, any minister at all or any person, be so presumptuous to think that they have a corner on the market with God to force him to do their will, God is going to do just the opposite. You can be guaranteed that. Now, let's go to Matthew, the sixth chapter, and let's see something concerning the will of God, concerning concerning what is in the law of Moses, and wh- what is in the law of Moses that is most objected to. Obviously, the Sabbath, that is the most objected to. And it's even to the point now where people are being taught well, it's okay to work on the Sabbath if your family is starving. Uh, it's okay to go out and do good humanistic works on the Sabbath, such as build houses for uh, Habitat for Humanity. Because after all, God doesn't want you to starve, and God wants you to provide for your family, because if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. And hear those scriptures, and yes, 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 and if you're sleepy, and if you're not studying the Bible, and if you don't know what the Word of God is, then you're going to be, woo, in really bad shape. But you see, the truth is, the Ten Commandments are part of the Gospel, are they not? If the gospel contains is also contained in the Old Testament, are not then the Ten Commandments part of the gospel? Okay? Hold your place here in Matthew 6, and let's go back, and let's just, just read this section. Let's go to um, Deuteronomy 6, since we go to Exodus 20 all the time. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 5, rather, not 6, Deuteronomy 5 where the Ten Commandments are listed there, and let's just read the ones concerning the Sabbath. And then we'll ask some questions concerning the Sabbath, so that we will know. Now, I'm covering some of this, and I know it's very basic. And I kind of feel like the Apostle Paul when he wrote the book of Hebrews. He said, you know, can't we just go beyond the principles of Christ unto perfection? Well, I would have to say no, because we've got to go back and pick up the basics every once in a while. Too many people are not ready to go on to perfection. I'll try and start that next week. But uh, we need to cover this so we so we know exactly what we're saying. Okay? Let's pick it up here in verse 12. This is chapter 5, book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy means the second giving of the law. And in the book of Deuteronomy, as we will see next week, there are many things concerning the gospel of Christ and the gospel as to how we should keep it in the New Testament. Many, many things. Okay. Notice verse 12. Keep the Sabbath. Now, in Exodus 20, it says, remember the Sabbath. Here he says, keep the Sabbath. Now, that's pretty direct, isn't it? Question, does God want us to keep the Sabbath? Yes. Yes. It says, keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days shall you labor and do all your work unless you're unemployed. 
unless your family is starving. No. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now, if you love God and fear God and keep his commandments, are you going to keep it? Is it not part of the gospel of Christ? Yes, it is. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work unless it's time and a half or perhaps double time. No, doesn't say that, does it? So if any man comes along and says to you, well, now, you know, the Sabbath for us today is Christ in us and the rest of Christ being in us is our Sabbath. You know what that explanation is? Any guesses? That is mental insanity. That's not true. Christ in you motivates you to keep the Sabbath correct. Not the opposite, to give up on it. You shall not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your ox, nor your ass, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gate, that your manservant and maidservant may rest as well as you, and remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt. Now, when we come to the Days of Unleavened Bread, which we will be coming to here very quickly, it'll be upon us faster than we know, what is Egypt picture? Egypt is a type of sin. The Pharaoh is a type of Satan. They're the ones who have you working seven days a week because you're slaves to the system. So he's saying, remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Now today, if Christ were here to open our minds to tell us what it would be, it would not surprise me one bit if he said, you were a slave to this world system. Therefore, you keep the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath day, you remember what it was like to live without the Sabbath. It's quite instructive, see. And that the Lord your God brought you out with a mighty hand. Question. Who calls any individual? God does, doesn't he? Does it take a mighty hand sometimes? Something even greater than a mighty hand? What is the strongest thing in the world to change? The human mind. So when God's Spirit comes to call you and bring you out of the world, that's greater than a mighty hand. Because he is not just changing your position from one place to another. He is changing your mind from being hostile to God to opening your mind to love God. That's a tremendous difference. So he brought you out with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. He commanded you. Now, Let's go back to Matthew 6 and see that Matthew 6 is built upon the Sabbath commandment. Since we understand that the Sabbath is part of the gospel, and we will see that confirmed when we come back to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And this is very basic for us to go through, because, you know, brethren, there are people now who have kept the Sabbath for years and are wondering... Should we keep the Sabbath? But what happens? What happens when someone comes along and teaches you to sin? Does anyone know what that is called in the Bible? What is that called? It is the doctrine of what? The doctrine of Balaam. Yes. Because Balaam was hired by Balak to come and curse the children of Israel. You can read that in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. 
And he went up on a high mountain. He saw all the children of Israel, and all he could do was bless. So Balak gave him all his money, and he was coming out of his gourd. He said, now look, I gave you this money, and I hired you to curse them. And he said, and you run up here on top of the mountain, and you bless them. Now go on up there and curse them. So he goes on up again, and he blesses them. And Balak is really getting out of shape, see. Really getting mad. He said, didn't I hire you to curse them? He says, well, I can only do what the Lord will allow. And he says, now go on up there again and curse him. So he went up and blessed him with the longest, best blessing that you could read. And so Balak was really angry. So the Jude tells us that what Balaam did was teach Balak to cast a stumbling block in front of the children of Israel to entice them to sin so that God would have to correct them. Now that's happening within any church. Sunday keepers are doing that in relationship to Sabbath, are they not? Yes, they are. Sabbath keepers who are now ready to shift over to Sunday keeping, are they not doing the same thing by saying, it's okay to work on a Sabbath when God says you shall not do any work? It's one thing if there's an ox in the ditch. It's another thing if a car is broken down. But you don't go to the junkyard every Sabbath and resurrect all the cars. You see? In other words, you don't throw them into the ditch. And that's what they're doing. Now we're going to see that Matthew 6 is inexorably tied to the Sabbath it has to be. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. It always happens, doesn't it not? Have you ever worked for a partnership where the bosses were equal, and then they got into a feud? Try that sometime. It'll give you fits or else he will hold to the one and despise the other now is that not happening with those who are rejecting and despising the laws of God the commandments of God yes yes indeed you cannot serve God and mammon now hold your place right here and let's go to mark the second chapter let's look at this thing concerning Master. It could also be translated Lord, because it comes from the Greek word kurios. Now let's look at that in relationship to the Sabbath. And there, there, are, you're going to hear a passel of sermons that are coming out, uh, going to cover a lot of these same things. Now let's come to um, verse 23. And it came to pass that he went through the grain fields, as it should read, not corn as we understand corn. But that wouldn't be too bad, you know, if you were back in Iowa walking through a cornfield and the corn was ripe and you just reach up and snap off an ear and peel it back. Have you ever ate that fresh sweet corn right off the cob? Raw, oh man, it's good. Okay. And as they went, they began to pluck the ears of grain, and the Pharisees said unto them, Now this is their own law, because it says that you shall not reap the corners, you shall leave it for the poor. And if anyone is passing through your field, he can pluck a little and eat, but he's not to stop there and encamp and harvest. But the Pharisees said, If you, if you, um, uh, you know, pluck a head of corn on the Sabbath, you're working, you're laboring, you're harvesting. That's not a law of God. So he says, Behold, why do, why do they do on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? There was no law against it, except their own tradition. So that's why they're saying this. So Jesus 
Jesus answered with another one for them to figure out, which was greater and harder to figure out. He said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in, when he had need and, uh, he was hungered and he and they that were with him, he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread. Now the showbread, if you recall from the, the, uh, slides on the, or the book on the tabernacle, there was a loaf of bread which was especially baked and was in a, a special container and there was one loaf for each one of the twelve tribes of Israel and these were before the Lord constantly. They had to change them every week. The priest could eat it. And the priest could give it to his family. No problem with it. Now, Let's ask the question concerning David. Because here's the, here is the correct answer. Who was David? Not yet. He was not yet king at this point. He was being, he was the, the king designated. Okay? What was also David? In addition to being the king designate and later to be king. Was he not also a prophet of God? Yes, he was. Did he not prophesy concerning Christ in the Psalms? Concerning many things in the Psalms? Yes, he did. So you see, the correct answer is that even though it was unlawful for anyone else to eat it, the truth is to give it to David and David to give it to his men because they had need was not against the laws of God whatsoever. Okay, let's go on. And did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and also to them which were with him. So he gave them something to try and figure out. If they're so smart and condemn people for plucking a head of grain, then go figure this one out. If you want to figure out between what is lawful and what is not lawful. Because the most important thing is that you worship and serve God in spirit and truth. So he said, verse 27, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. And as we've seen in the past, for the purpose of fellowshipping with God. Not just for the purpose of fellowshipping with each other. That is necessary. And that is true. But if we just fellowship with ourselves and God is not there, well, then there is no reason for us to come together, then is there? It was made for man for that specific purpose. And not man for the Sabbath. In other words, man is not going to go tell God who made and created the Sabbath. God, I don't want to keep your Sabbath. It gets in the way. Now, I can't earn a living. Well, what do you think Satan wants to get the whole world bound up into? So busy, just like in Egypt, that you have to work seven days to meet the bare, meager things of even living? So man is not going to come along and tell God, force God, that's why this is so significant, it is another thing to presume that you can force or make God to to be moved to do your will. No, it's not for man. Therefore, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is Lord. Now, the word for Lord is Master. Curios. You cannot serve two masters, Matthew 6.24. And he's saying the same thing here. The Sabbath was made for man by God and not man for the Sabbath. Because there's one Lord of the Sabbath, which is Jesus Christ. And you can't serve two Sabbaths to do the activities of men. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. This, brethren tells us that the Christian Sabbath is the same day that God gave 
to ancient Israel, the seventh day of the week. And Christ is Lord of it. Now let's go back to Matthew 6 and let's read what he says, and this ties directly in with the Sabbath. Now Dwight Blevins from um, Grand Junction called me, and, and he'd been studying this, and so he's the one that planted the seed for today's sermon. He said, when you read Matthew 6, is this not tied directly into the Sabbath and working? Let's read it. Verse 25. After he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. That's very interesting, isn't it? You can't keep the Sabbath while you're working on it to earn a living. And mammon is living. Uh, riches. To get money. Now, verse 25. Therefore I say to you, go work on the Sabbath, it's okay. Because I know you got to live. I know you have to survive. Now, that's perfectly all right with me. No, he doesn't say that. He says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, the very basic necessities, correct? Nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than food and the body more than raiment? Is it not? Yes. Yes, indeed. I says, now look, go out and observe the fowl of the air. They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them, and are you not much better than they? What is he really saying here? He's saying that if you don't trust God to provide for you, obviously in the Sabbath-keeping situation here, then you are counting yourself less than the birds. You are counting yourself in a situation that you are really actually saying, God cannot provide for me. Which then is what? That's accusing God, is it not? Yes, it is. Are you not much better than they? And which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? He says, no, I know you need to be clothed. Don't worry about it. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God is going to clothe you if he's going to take care of the plants, if he's going to provide for the birds, if he's going to provide for his whole creation, which he does, and his whole creation is is an expression of his love to all of mankind. Verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now that's why we have said that the Sabbath is a test commandment, is it not? Yes. Well, the truth is, every commandment is a test commandment, is it not? Will you keep my commandments or no? Yes. Every one is. So you have to have faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Boy, you know, this Sabbath commandment's pretty tough. And, you know, my bank account's really getting low. And my wife over here is nagging at me, and my children are hungry, and they have holes in their shoes, and they're just about ready to go barefoot. Therefore, God, I'm going to break the Sabbath and go work because I don't have one bit of faith in you to, for you to provide. That's what they're saying, are they not? What should they do? They should go to God. And if they're having a difficult time on the Sabbath day, pray and draw closer to God. Ask for his spirit in love. And do the things that please God. He'll gladly provide for you. 
I just talked to a man recently whose wife was just beating him over the head, so to speak. Well, you turned down all these jobs because of the Sabbath. And this last one was really a good one. And now the church says you can work on the Sabbath. And yet you refused. So he held to keeping the Sabbath, and God blessed him with a better job than any of those that he turned down. God was able to provide. Can he not do that? Yes. Okay? Now, verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, and they work seven days a week, don't they? And they don't keep the Sabbath, do they? So this is intrinsically bound up in the Sabbath command, isn't it? For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. God knows. If you know, God knows. And if God knows, he'll take care of it. Maybe not in the way you think or in the means or the manner in which you suspect. Maybe it will not be as much because there are other lessons to learn. Maybe it will be more than you expect because God is is blessing you above and beyond. And that's all in God's hands. That's all in, in God's uh, relationship with you. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God. That's what it needs to be. God will take care of it. Now, can you truly seek the kingdom of God if you're not keeping the Sabbath? When the Sabbath pictures the whole situation concerning the kingdom of God. No. And his righteousness. Now let's just plug in here concerning the imputed righteousness of God. That's what you're to seek. Would God break his own Sabbath? Did God break his own Sabbath? No. No, if you go back and read Exodus 16 and the giving of the manna. What did God do? He gave manna for six days. And five of those days, he said, now look, you just go out and you get a certain much for every one. Now, don't keep it over till the next day, because it's going to breed worms and stink. But on the sixth day, you go out and you gather twice as much. And then you prepare for the Sabbath, And you can keep it over, and it won't breed worms and stink. Now consider the fact that this happened for 40 years, every single week. That's quite a thing, isn't it? Now, some of them thought, boy, I'm going to go out and get some manna on this Sabbath day. So they went out to look, and God said, no. What, you know, how long refuse you to keep my commandments? And that was long before the giving of the Ten Commandments. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, just exactly what you need. Now, some people are going to be blessed more than another. Does that mean they're more righteous? No. No, 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 no. It does not. It just means that God has blessed them more than others. So therefore, if someone has more than you, you don't get mad at God and say, well, you didn't give it to me, you gave it to him. No, that's not it. Here's what we're to do, verse 34. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. That means do not be anxious, do not be worried. If you have faith in God and trust in God, he will provide. For the borrow shall take the thought uh, for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, isn't it true? Every day has got its own problems, right? Yes. So handle those day by day. The question is, because you said, the question is, how do we differentiate what I said by one person receiving more of a blessing than another as compared with what it says in the Old Testament that if you do these things, you will be blessed? I didn't say the lack of blessing. 
I just said that he, God may give someone more, bless them with more, that rather than you, I'm not saying that he isn't going to bless you or provide for you. Okay. Now, let's just turn the page back, Matthew 6, and let's see how this all ties in together. Matthew 6 and, and verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray which is how you develop faith. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, as it is in heaven, on earth, in earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we need. We need the will of God. And that will answer the question, how is God going to bless us? Maybe God is going to bless us with a trial because he has a greater purpose in mind. And sometimes we don't know while we're going through those trials that he has a greater purpose in mind. But nevertheless, that's how God works. Notice the next verse. Give us this day our daily bread. So that ties in with the rest of Matthew 6 where it says, give no thought about what you will eat, what you'll drink, so forth. For God will take care of you. Now, in relationship to that, let me finish this letter here. We were members of the WCG for about 25 years. Then things started to change. First off, they had first, second, third tithe, tithe of the tithe, excess second tithe, building fund, and uh, special funds, uh, work two or three jobs if you had to, etc., to keep it up and tithe on the gross. They lived like kings in mansions and pools and two or three homes, get planes, some things, uh, it, something is rotten in, uh, in uh, California. I had to get out. Now, changes again. Work on the Sabbath. Work on the holy days. Holy days are not commandment. Uh, eat unclean meats are okay, etc. Anyway, anyway, your book, Lord, What Should I Do, is ref refreshing. Please send me four copies. So I will. We get many, many such letters back. And we can help that way, brethren, an awful lot. When you wrap your whole life up in serving God, and then someone comes along and steals it from you, and then after they steal it, they begin throwing it away. It's no wonder that there are a lot of people in just such terrible, terrible, terrible shape out there. Now let's go back. And let's read some commands concerning the Sabbath. Because we do need to have this basic sermon concerning the Sabbath and the light of the things that are going on. And I just want you to, to understand, we related here Exodus 16 already, but let's go back there for just a minute because this is important. Exodus 16 and verse Uh, 25. Exodus 16 and verse 25. After the whole incident concerning the sab uh, giving of the manna. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. There will be no manna there. Now what is this also telling us? What was manna? Food, correct. Who provided it? God did. That ties right in with Matthew 6. Is that not correct? Yes. Is not God able to provide? Yes. Does he want you to work on the Sabbath? No, as we saw. He said no work, not any work. And don't be throwing everything into the ditch so you have an excuse to work. Okay? There won't be any out there. Question, if God was not going to send the manna and there wasn't going to be anything out there for them, do you think that God will bless anyone for Sabbath breaking when they know better? Do you think that God is going to bless them with their work? Now what's going to happen to these poor people who say, okay, well I believe what so-and-so said about it's okay to work on the Sabbath. I'll go ahead and work on the Sabbath. Now what happens if they lose their job?
Now they're going to be in worse shape. Because with the devisings of men, you're not going to force God to do your will. God is not going to bless that effort. God is not going to do that, uh, uh, prosper you in what you do when it's sin. We've all tried it, haven't we? Haven't we all kidded ourselves and said, well, you know, God understands. This sin won't hurt a little bit. After all, I'm trying to do good. That's what everybody wants to do, do good in their sinning. Okay? Yes. No. No. I've done that. Did I prosper in it? Nope. Did I do well in it? Nope. Was I happy in it? Nope. Was God pleased in it? No. Did God in his mercy and graciousness and love lead me to repentance? Yes. Which means that he doesn't want me to do it, right? Right. So it's the same way with any of us and in anything we do. Now, verse 27. Came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day to gather. Now, these are hard-working people, right? Diligent. Yes, workaholics. In this case, manaholics. They want to go out and get more manna. And they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, Now this is really quite something what he said here. He didn't say, Now I understand. You know, these people have been bound up in Egypt for so long, and I know that they worked every day. Now, you know, I understand that they had to go out and look just to satisfy their own curiosity. No. He said, How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? Now, I want you to make special note of that, and always remember Exodus sixteen twenty-eight. That's a very important verse. Why? Because when people get into these, to these arguments concerning Old Testament, New Testament, laws and commandments, the giving of it and so forth, please understand that the laws and commandments of God were in effect before they ever got to Mount Sinai. Before God ever spoke them, that's what it's saying right here. How long refuse you to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. It is a gift. The Sabbath is a creation and a gift from God. So that you can fellowship with God, so that you can love God, so that God can love you. So that God can instruct you out of his word. God is the one who has a corner on the Sabbath. God is the one who has a corner on the truth, not us. God has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he has given you on the sixth day. So here's another gift, a miraculous gift. The bread of two days, abide every man in his place, and let no man go out of his place on the Sabbath day. So the people rested on the Sabbath day. Okay, now let's come to Exodus 20, verse 8. We're just going to read some very important things here. Very fundamental for us to understand. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No other day can be holy except the holy days. Sunday is not holy. God never made it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day of the Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your manservant nor your maidservant nor your cattle nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days it goes back to creation. What is the authority of the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments? The creation. God made it. When you keep the Sabbath, <clears throat> you know that in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now all the way through, let's come to chapter 23. And let's see what he says here. 
The Sabbath is perhaps one of the most often mentioned commands in the whole Bible. Verse 12, Exodus 23, Six days shall you do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your ass may rest, that your, the son of the, and the son of the handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed, in all these things I have said unto you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let it be heard out of your mouth. All right, let's come to chapter 31. This is just in the book of Exodus. I mean, we could go through Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus and all of that. Now, what I want you to do with Exodus 31, which becomes a very important thing concerning the Sabbath, which is this, let's understand something. Remember what we did a couple of weeks ago going through and showing in Numbers 11 concerning that the church was an extension of Israel? And that those Gentiles who were called or grafted into the olive tree of Israel? Now, with that in mind, let's read beginning verse 12. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Thus shall you speak unto the children of Israel, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep. Very important. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord your God that does sanctify you. Let's ask some questions here. What is the whole purpose of the New Testament for each one of those who are called saints? Why are you called saints? Because you have the Holy Spirit of God and you are sanctified. God is the one who has is sanctifying us. God is the one who sanctified the Sabbath, did he not? He blessed it and he sanctified it. Okay? Same way with us. That's why we are to keep the Sabbath. Now remember the children of Israel throughout your generations. If we are part of Israel now, spiritual Israel, are there still generations of Israel? Yes, indeed. Can we not have spiritual meaning out of these verses as well because it's part of the gospel? Absolutely. You therefore, you shall keep the Sabbath, for it is holy unto you, and every one that defiles it shall surely be put to death. Maybe not that day. Maybe not for many years. But what is the ultimate outcome? The wages of sin is death. When you teach people to sin, the wages of sin is death shall surely be put to death. And whoever, whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now I tell you what's going to happen. Those who begin breaking the Sabbath by working on it, because now the leader says it's okay to do it. And after all, you know, he said, Lord, I could. Did he not? If he says I could, Lord, I'm going to. Therefore, I'm justified. Let's go back to Genesis 3 for just a minute. Genesis 3 for just a minute. That's the same old, same old thing of human nature going way back. Genesis 3. When they got caught in their sins. Notice whose fault it was. Hold your place here in Exodus 31. We'll be back. Notice what happened. God came, and he was calling them, where are you? And they were hiding. And let's pick it up here in um, the verse 10. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? Now you can put any commandment in there, right? You can put anything in there. Have you done that which I said you should not do? Have you? Be it the Sabbath, be it idols, 
be it taking God's name in vain, be it any of the commandments of God, be it anything in the New Testament, you put it there. Okay? And the man said, yep, I sure did. God, I'm terribly sorry. No, what did he do? He said, the woman that you gave me. Now, what is he really saying? God, you're the one. You're at fault. Not me. But the woman you gave me. Now, he wanted her, desired her, presented to him. He said, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called woman. So you see, you're not going to have the cop out by blaming a church leader. Even if a church leader comes and says, do this or that or the other thing, if it's against the law of God, commandments of God, you're not to do it. Okay, let's go on here, verse 13. So, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, well, look, it really wasn't my fault. It was this, it was this serpent that stuck in here, see? Okay. He beguiled me and I did eat. So God took care of them all. He said, look, you're not going to escape the judgment or the penalty for what you have done. So likewise today, those who go out and work, because a church leader has said it's okay to work. Now, let's understand something concerning things like childbirth or an accident or something like that. There are things which need to be done. And, and, you know, babies come because babies come. And it is called child labor. It is painful and it is in travail. So God certainly expects that to be taken care of. And I'm sure that if you're coming to Sabbath services and you're in an accident, that you're going to be very happy that a highway patrolman is there to help you or an ambulance is there to help you. Now, in this world, there are those things that go on. However, how many here have had an accident coming to Sabbath services? No hands raised. You see? How many here? Well, you might remember or might not. Had your children born on the Sabbath day? Okay? If a person is a nurse and, say, works in a hospital, there are certain things that need to be done. But like I was talking to a nurse last night who called, she says, well, she says, there are always plenty of people who want to come and work on Saturday, so I just swap shifts with them. So you see, where your desire is to please God and serve Him, there's going to be a way. God will provide a way. Okay, I've often had people ask me this. Well, how do you keep the Sabbath at the North Pole? And my answer is, when I get a letter from someone from the North Pole, I'll answer it. In the meantime, that question cannot be answered because no one is there to keep the Sabbath. What do you do? What do you do when you live in a high, high northern latitude and you have a, a whole lot of dark? Then you go by, you you calculate it by what you see. And that's how you calculate the Sabbath. And it will generally work out to be approximately 24 hours long. What about when the sun never sets in the summer? Well, when it dips to its lowest point, in the middle of the lowest point, that's the ending of the day. So you go from there. Now, let's come back to Exodus 31, verse 15. Six days may work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest only to the Lord. Whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for. Look at this next word. A perpetual covenant. This is in addition to the covenant that was given at Sinai. This is a special Sabbath keeping covenant. Why did he make it a special Sabbath-keeping covenant for a perpetual covenant? I would have to say, brethren, for the New Testament church, why else? Knowing that we would not have a temple, knowing that we would not have a priesthood, but still keep it, right? Verse 17, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and... On the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. 
Now you can go through many other places. Let's come clear over to Exodus the 20th chapter, not Exodus, but Ezekiel the 20th chapter. Why did the children of Israel go into captivity? Because they broke the commandments of God and broke the Sabbath? Ezekiel the 20th chapter. Okay? This is quite a lesson. How important is it? And when we read this, let's understand that God says in the book of Ezekiel three times, I don't delight in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways. Let's pick it up Ezekiel 20 and let's just start right at the first of the chapter. Ezekiel 20. In verse 1, came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then came the word of the Lord to me, saying, Speak unto the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Are you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord, I will not be inquired of by you. In other words, just like I started out. It is one thing to be moved by God to do his will. It's another thing to presume that you can force or make God to uh, to move God to do your will. That's what he just said here. You're going to come and question me? What God said. As I live, says the Lord, I will not be inquired of you. Will you judge them, O son of man? Will you judge them? cause them to know the abominations of their fathers. So now we have a history lesson. Hold your place right here and go to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, for just a minute, please. Paul gave a history lesson there, didn't he? What was the history lesson? 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10. And let's pick it up here in verse 5. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these were things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Now what did we just read about in Exodus 16 on lusting? Going out to break the Sabbath, correct? Yes. Neither be idolaters as some of those of some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to drink to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as they also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Do we not tempt Christ when we reject the Sabbath? Yes, we do. Neither murmur. And is that not what's happening? Complaining, murmuring, criticizing against God. See? That's what he's saying in Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. You going to come and inquire of me? You going to come and complain to me? Go read the whole book of Jeremiah, how merciful God was. Where he said over and over and over again, you find some people that will do what is right and I'll turn back this captivity. I'll change it. I don't want them to die. Now these things, verse 11, happened unto them for examples uh, and are written for our admonition upon the whom the end of the ends of the world are come. Are we living in the last days? Yes. More so than Paul? Yes. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And he said, they're not falling now, they're pushing. Yea, they are running. Let's go back to Ezekiel 20 again. So let's have a little history lesson here in Exodus 20. Quite instructive. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God, In the day when I chose Israel and lifted my hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt. Now has God made himself known to you? Did God send his spirit today to make himself known? Yes. What is the whole thing that we are to know? We are to know God. We are to know Christ. We are to know the Father. Is that not correct? He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Didn't we study that in 1 John? Yes, indeed. And the one who is keeping the commandments and walking the way that Jesus did in what? 
in him is the love of God being perfected, correct? Yes. So just as God chose them, he chose us. When I lifted up my hand to them, saying, I am the Lord your God, in the day that I lifted up my hand to them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into a land that I spied out for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands, then I said to them, Cast you away every man the abominations of his eyes, whatever it may be, an idol, fornication, adultery, stealing, idolatry, taking God's name in vain, breaking the Sabbath, whatever it may be, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. Then what are we doing today? We're going back in Memphis, Tennessee. They've got a whole pyramid back there. Did you know that? Where they take people through and they run them through the, the, the demonic initiations into the ancient rites of Egyptian religion. Right here in the United States. He says, don't defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me. And they wouldn't listen to me. They did not every man cast away the abomination of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour forth my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I wrought for my name's sake that it sh should not be polluted before the heathen among whom they were. In other words, he said, even while they were in the land of Egypt, they were so involved in idolatry that he was even going to, to destroy them right in the land of Egypt before he ever called them out. So what did they do when they got to Mount Sinai? And Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days. He said, Aaron, make his calves. Okay? So he didn't do it. In his sight I made myself known unto them in bringing them forth out of the land of Egypt. Wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. The righteousness, number one, of the letter of the law. Correct? Yes. Moreover, he said, in addition to that, I also gave them my Sabbaths, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord to sanctify them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. They despised my judgments. Can you imagine what it must have been like? No wonder Moses complained all the time. Oh, Lord, you got me saddled down with all these people. You know, when they were good, they were the people of God. When they were bad, they were Moses' people. You know, all the, all the way through there. Okay? And my Sabbath they greatly polluted. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness and consume them, and I wrought for my name's sake. I held back, no, I didn't do it, that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. Even Moses said, now God, consider. Consider what the other nations are going to say if you kill them. That you brought them out here to destroy them. Now think about that, Lord. Okay, and he did. Yet I also lifted up my hand unto them in the wilderness, so that I would not bring them into the land which I uh, had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of the land, because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths, and their heart went after their idols. Now today, what is the idol today? Mammon, money, dollars, bucks, power, prestige, notoriety, clothes, car. We have so many things out there that could be abominations, it's unreal. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I, I make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said to their children, now he's referring to the book of Deuteronomy, the children, the second giving of the law, I said to their children, before they went into the to the land. Walk not in the statutes of your father, neither observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my words. Same thing. Exactly the same thing.
And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Nevertheless, the children rebelled against me. And all you have to do is read the book of of, uh, Joshua and the book of Judges. And as soon as Joshua and the elders died, what did they do? Right back to Sunday keeping, right back to Christmas keeping, right back to those things. And mark my words, when they quit keeping the Sabbath, that's exactly what's going to happen again. It will happen. So they rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do to them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then said I, I would pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them, nevertheless I withdrew my hand. So God just finally threw his hands up and said, All right, if you want it, I'm going to let you have your own ways. And when you get so filled with your own ways and your own idolatry and your own pollution and your own wretchedness and your own rottenness, then you come crying to me, then I'll hear. So, verse 24 he said, because they executed not my judgments and had despised my Sabbaths and had polluted, polluted or despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths and their eyes went after their father's idols, wherefore I gave them over to statutes which were not good. Their own way, their own laws, their own civil governments, correct? Yes. Their own religion. He just said, I'll just give you over to it. If you want it, have it. You got it. The whole thing. Which were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live, and I polluted them in their own gifts. Worst thing that could happen to anyone, brethren, is just be left to wallow in your own sin. Isn't it? Yes. Yes. And in that they, they cause to pass through the fire all that opens the womb. In other words, they just went into to the to the whole same situation that the Mayans down in in ancient Mexico went through. The reason God destroyed those civilizations because they were doing the same thing, going through the fire, cannibalism, offering to the gods, so evil and awful that one of their special sacrifices was to cut open the sacrificial human victim and take out the heart while it was still uh, beating and drink the blood of it. Now, you see some of these things and all the archaeologists say, I wonder why these civilizations no longer exist. Read the Bible, okay? Okay? That I might make them desolate to the end, that they might know that I am the Lord. To the end, that they might understand that I am God. And so sometimes God just does that. Just turns you over to your own devices until you learn the lesson. Some things you can learn quite quickly. We're going to do a series in the love of God in the Bible that is is really the whole heart and core as to why the church is going through everything it is. When you really understand it, the love of God is the greatest thing, the greatest fulfillment and attainment in your life. And it does take your life. That's why as you go through life and life is empty and you get older and there's no satisfaction, that's why the whole experience of Solomon is there. He had all these physical things and all the power and all the money and all the wealth and every convenience that you could ever want. And he said, I'm a, just a bag of wind. I'm just an empty, hollow, frustrated old man. Why? Because he never learned the love of God. Love of God is the greatest thing. We can't be playing third grade sandbox anymore going back to these things. If someone is not convinced they ought to keep the Sabbath after being in the church of God 25 years, well then I cannot be too much help to you. You should go help yourself. You know, isn't that what Jesus said? You go learn what these things mean. Okay? Now let's come back here to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. 
and this will help us understand. Remember what we just read in Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, whereas he destroyed those in the wilderness because they didn't believe. Then he said to the children, now look, you're going to go into the promised land now. Here's what God says. Now, let's come back here to Hebrews, uh, well, let's go back to um, uh, chapter 3 and verse 15. While it is said, today if you will uh, hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Now notice, he didn't say angered, but grieved. Was it not with those who had sinned? I mean, can you have the very presence of God in the cloud by day and the fire by night, every day and every night? And have the manna come six days every week and the Sabbath every week and still have the gall to keep your own idols? Wow, that's something, isn't it? Yes. Whose carcass fell in the wilderness. And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest. Boy, going into the promised land, that's a tremendous rest. You compare that with wandering into Sinai. I remember one time we went down to, to, um, what is that, Palm Springs? Boy, was it hot. And I thought, man, how would you like to walk in that desert? All that heat. Yep, they did. Still didn't believe God. So you see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The spies came back and said, oh, look, they're giants. Oh, we can't go in. Joshua and Caleb said, oh, yes, God will take care of it for us. Now, chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left any of us of entering into his rest, and that is the ultimate reward of God, into the millennium. Now we're not talking about the promised land. We are talking about the kingdom of God. That's the rest we are talking about. Any of you should seem to come short of. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. As I sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. So this is showing that the Sabbath is a continuous type of the rest of God. The rest of God is not Christ in you, so therefore you perpetually keep the Sabbath. Every day. And as one man said, when do you work then? See, it doesn't happen that way. The seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, which we just read about in uh, Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limited a certain day, saying in David. And what was that day? That's pictured by the Sabbath psalm, which says today. That's what he quoted over here, if you will hear his voice. Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now, is this not the same thing as it is with every covenant of God? Hear his voice, obey his words, thus saith the Lord, thus says Jesus, thus says the prophets, if you will hear his words, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, now this should read Joshua, and most Bibles have an explanation of it there, and some of the newer translations have Joshua, because they understood that it was Joshua who led them into the promised land. And the sense of it is this way. For if Joshua had given them rest, in other words, and that was the fulfillment and the completion of God's plan, then he, God, would not have afterwards spoken of another day. And that other day is the coming of the kingdom of God. That other day is the millennial rest of God. Verse 9, very important. Therefore, and unfortunately the King James is not clear, 
Therefore, there remains a rest to the people of God. Now, this is an entirely different word. All the way through, the word for rest in the Greek is katapazin, which means rest, recline, repose uh, from your labor and hard work. This one, verse 9, is an entirely different word for rest, and it in the Greek is uh, 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 sabaton, what is that? I got that mixed up with, with the book of Luke. The Greek word here is sabotismos, sabotismos, S-A-B-B-A-T-I-S-M-O-S, sabotismos, which means a keeping of the Sabbath. New Testament command, therefore there remains for the people of God. Who are the people of God? The ones that have the Spirit of God, correct? A keeping of the Sabbath. Why? Because God's plan is not complete and the Sabbath pictures the completion of that plan, doesn't it? There remains, therefore, a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest is... A, he also has ceased from his own works as did God. Now then comes a statement showing that after we have the Sabbath keeping, what are we to do spiritually? Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, the ultimate reward of God to us, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And what is it when you tell people you can work on the Sabbath? It's unbelief, is it not? Sure it is. Plain and simple. Now, let's go to Isaiah 66 for just a minute. Isaiah 66. Because when Christ returns, and every Sunday keeper knows this, if they've read their Bible, and a lot of Sunday keepers read their Bibles. That's why some Sunday keepers are still they're either closet Sabbath keepers or they keep the Sabbath. Isaiah 66, okay? When Christ returns, he's going to obviously do away with the Sabbath because it's an inconvenience to everyone, right? Of course not. Isaiah 66 and verse 23. And it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Every Sabbath. Now, since we're in Isaiah, and we have just a little bit of time left here, let's go to Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56 and verse 1. Is this not part of what Christ opened the mind and understanding to the Disciples, yes it is. Thus says the Lord, keep you judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. This is just right at the, just before the return of Christ. Blessed is the man that does this and the son of man that lays hold on this, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it. And keeps his hand from doing any evil. That means all the commandments, doesn't it? Does it not? Sure it does. Neither let the son of the stranger, the, the Gentile now that has joined himself unto the Lord, say, speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. Now, eunuch is, you know, that's the most shameful thing to happen to a man, right? Thus says the Lord, unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, that choose the things that please me, and takes hold of my covenant. Did we not just go through the things that please God? Yes. And this covenant takes hold of my covenant? This can be concerning the uh, the new covenant, but did we not read of a special covenant concerning the Sabbaths of God, which include the seventh day and, and the, the holy days in Exodus 31? Yes, we did. Okay. Even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that it shall not be cut off. You go back and read the promise to the seven churches, and I will give him a new name. Correct? Yes. 
and also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is.